Our speaker tonight could talk to us for hours about his more than 30 years as an undercover agent. After all, he was involved in 50 undercover assignments during his career. But for our purposes, he's going to focus on three cases involving East Coast Mafia crime families. We will have plenty of time for questions tonight, so I hope you and expect that you will have an, a wide array of questions for our speaker once he's concluded his presentation. Uh, our speaker tonight is a retired FBI special agent who, during his career, infiltrated Italian-American crime groups, the Russian Mafia, the Mexican drug cartels, outlaw motorcycle gangs, and, of course, corrupt politicians. All of these investigations led to arrests, convictions, and lengthy prison sentences. In addition to his undercover assignments, he was also very involved in the 9-11 investigation in Boston and the 2013 Boston Marathon bombings investigation. In his post-FBI career, he continues to provide training and mentoring to new undercover agents. And, and now also provides consulting and technical advising services to the entertainment industry. He recently served as a law enforcement consultant uh, on the set of the film Equalizer 2, starring Denzel Washington. He's also mentioned to me he's done some uh, TV shows and, and, uh, as well. His memoir is called Ghost, My 30 Years as an FBI Undercover Agent. Uh, we will have copies down in the store afterward, and uh, our speaker will be available to sign those for you. Um, I would also mention that his book has been, uh, the film rights to the book have been optioned by Sylvester Stallone's Balboa Productions. So uh, what I think Stallone and his associates are looking to do is a, a feature film as well as a TV series based on the contents of the book. So obviously it caught his attention as well. Uh, please join me in welcoming Michael McGowan. <laughs> Undercover work <clears throat> is hard. It's very, very difficult. It takes a toll on you. When I first started working undercover, I was 6'4", blonde and good looking. <laughs> right, I'd beat you up. All right, I'd like to thank um, Ashley and Jeff for inviting me to the Mob Museum. I'd like to thank you for coming to hear me. You will see quickly that I'm not a professional speaker, uh, but I speak from the heart. Um, I have a couple of caveats that I start with. One is that you're going to hear my story, my FBI story, and I want to make sure that you understand that um, everything done in the FBI is done on a team basis, a team effort. If you ever hear anybody tell you that they did great things in the FBI by themselves, they're not telling you the truth, okay? I can tell you about my stories, my adventures, but in everything I do and the things we're gonna talk about tonight, it was a team environment and I worked with great agents and great police officers, all right? Um, quickly, I retired from the FBI in July of 2017 after 31 years of service. And prior to the FBI, I was a police officer for about five years. So I've been doing this stuff for about 35 years. And what everybody asks me about now is the last year and a half since I've retired about my fun times in Hollywood, okay? Working on movies and TV shows and blah, blah, blah. I also make it clear that all that really matters is what happened here. Right? This was the important stuff. This is what um, I want to be remembered for. Not a TV show, not a movie. All right? <clears throat> I have kind of an interesting career in the FBI. <clears throat> I'm going to walk you through the book <clears throat> uh, in order, and we'll be able to um, uh, talk a little bit about some cases I did on the East Coast involving the LCN, the La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. Okay, uh, I came out here, the museum was kind enough to bring me out here a day early, and I toured this museum yesterday, and I was fascinated by some of the history uh, of organized crime in this country. Okay, I learned more yesterday than I did probably in 35 years in the FBI. There's a, there's a, uh, a lot of history, obviously, to organize crime, uh, but you have to understand at the time it was my job, okay? 
Um, I, I would get an assignment. This is the target group. These are the people you're looking at. These are the predicated crimes that they are believed to be involved in. And I went to work with, with dozens and dozens of other agents. All right? Uh, but again, getting back to the book, um, this book that you all see was never meant for public consumption. Okay? I wrote this book for four people. I wrote it for my wife and for my three children. Okay, I wrote it, for my, I wrote it to, for my wife to thank her for taking care of our family while I was running around doing this stuff. And I wrote it to explain to my children the type of childhood that they had and when they would see their dad do strange things in the middle of the night or talk into a tape recorder in the basement. Um, my children used to have to wake me up when they, when they were little, my children would wake me up with a broom handle because I had come out of sleep one time and grabbed my son by the throat. He was eight years old at the time. All right? Kids kind of don't understand why their dad's grabbing their throat when they're eight years old. So I wrote it for my children. I wrote it for my uh, wife. It was not meant to see the light of day. I, uh, that's a story for another day, but we'll get into it. Um, so we're here now, Okay. Why did I name it Ghost? Okay, I named it Ghost. I wrote 357 pages, they cut it down to 305, and on 305 I explained why the name. <clears throat> and I wrote at the time, this is in 2007, 10 years before my retirement. <clears throat> I, was a, I was humbled to receive an award and I had to give a speech in front of 500 FBI agents. And this is one of the paragraphs I used 10 years before this book was written. I work in a specialty area within the FBI, which by its very nature is secretive, and whose success is recognized by the ability to remain unrecognized as an FBI agent. I'm not comfortable being recognized. I much prefer to remain a ghost, a shadow hiding in the background. Okay? A ghost also floats in and out of situations gathers evidence and leaves, okay? That was my job for 30 years, okay? Um, <clears throat> a little bit about leading up to this um, FBI story. Uh, because it was written for my family, not the general public, I spent a little time explaining my childhood to my children who weren't aware very much about my childhood. Uh, I grew up the son of a cop, my dad, was a, a city cop, my grandfather was a cop, and now my son is a cop, okay? We were blue bloods before they had blue bloods, all right? So I've been around police work all my life. I never thought I'd do anything else. I never thought I would join the FBI. I became a police officer a year out of college, and I was arresting people for things I had done a year earlier, <laughs> all right? A little bit strange, but... Okay, but I never envisioned to, I tell people two, two white envelopes changed my life, okay? My senior year in high school, I was joining the Marine Corps. I had no intention of attending college. I couldn't afford it. Uh, my family couldn't afford it. I got an envelope, a white envelope, that had a baseball scholarship in it to a college in Florida. Okay, I didn't even, I didn't even apply to the college. But I was able to go to college and obtain a degree which allowed me to apply to the FBI, okay? And then as a police officer, after about five years in a police uh, department, an FBI agent had handed me a packet of information and had the qualifications to be an agent, which because I had a college degree, I was now eligible. But he was smart because he put a second sheet in which had the salary. And the salary was double what I was making as a police, more than double what I was making as a police officer, and I had a baby and another baby on the way. So another white envelope, you are hereby appointed a special agent of the FBI, blah, blah, blah. And off I went to Quantico, Virginia in 1987, okay? And again, <clears throat> in, keeping in um, keeping in line with the book, I'll tell you a quick story about early in my career and then we'll get into the LCN aspect, okay? But in 1987, I came out of Quantico, Virginia, was assigned to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was assigned to a a international drug squad, it was called the Colombian Drug Squad at the time, which is not politically correct anymore, but in 1980s, all of our cocaine was coming from Colombia, and that's the um, 
assignment I was given, okay? Fast forward five years into my FBI career, and you're welcome to read this in the book down the road, but five years into my FBI career in October of 1992, myself and three other agents, we seized 50 kilograms of heroin uh, from Pakistan. And if you, I hope you don't know a lot about heroin, but if you do, 50 kilograms of heroin was valued at the time at about $180 million. Okay, we made that seizure without spending a dime. We convinced the bad guys to front it to us. And I think they're still getting, waiting to get paid, but uh, we, we arrested them, obviously. We extradited them to the United States. When that happened, and this, this was like the first third of the book, when that happened, there's a term in the FBI, you become a golden boy, one who can do no wrong. Okay, so within only five years of my FBI career, I was a golden boy. And everybody was heaping awards and accolades. And I was like, this is easy. This is the first five years. You know, the next 15 will be all downhill. I got it made here, okay? Fast forward a year and a half later. This is why I had a, a bizarre career. Fast forward a year and a half later, April of 1994, I kiss my wife and children goodbye one morning. I drive to work like I had for hundreds of days. And by five o'clock that night, the FBI had accused me of stealing $180 million worth of cocaine, uh, worth of heroin from inside a secure FBI evidence vault. Okay, all that dope that we stole, that was <laughs> <laughs> that's a Freudian slip. All the dope that we seized was stolen from inside an FBI evidence vault. I'm standing here today, so obviously I didn't do it, but that's how my career started. The FBI said, we think you stole $200 million, okay? How did I react to that? I reacted to that by basically dedicating the rest of my career to restoring my name, my integrity, my reputation, et cetera, because I hadn't had anything to do with the theft, obviously, all right? <clears throat> so now we get into undercover work. So uh, <clears throat> back in the, those days, there was no training, there was no training to work undercover. In the 80s, the FBI would assign you to work undercover, basically if you had been a cop or you'd been in the military. That was their criteria. I don't know why, okay? So <clears throat> relatively shortly after my career started, I started working undercover. My first assignment was to go into Italian social clubs and my specific instructions was to go into these clubs and find stuff out. Okay, that was the, what you're supposed to do. Go find, it wasn't stuff, but go find stuff out. Right? I had no idea what they're talking about, but I was happy to do it. I go into these Italian social clubs in Philadelphia, okay, pretty much dressed like I'm dressed today. Okay, didn't go too well. Right? I had no training, no experience, blah, blah, blah. I go into these places, they won't talk to me, they won't, they literally stop talking when I walk in, it was a joke. Okay, after about three or four weeks, a guy about 80 years old put his arm around my shoulder and said, kid, I really like you, but what the hell are you doing in here? You know, I might as well have FBI stamped on my forehead, complete waste of time, okay? I didn't know how to do it. Second undercover assignment after going 0 for 1, I go in, I get a picture of a, a fugitive, a violent fugitive, they say he's in the strip club, go in there. All you gotta do is find him, tell us he's in there, we'll come in and get him. How hard can that be? Okay, I go into the strip club, I have the, the picture in my jacket, I'm looking around for this guy and I don't see him, so of course I'm gonna be undercover. I go up to the bar and slap down and I say, give me a Diet Coke, okay? <laughs> I'm serious, you can't, you're an FBI agent, you can't drink on duty. I had no idea what I'm doing, literally none, okay? So after two or three Diet Cokes by myself in a streety, seedy strip club, I go to the men's room, and when I come out, guess what? No picture, okay? They went in and took the picture out, and I'm, I'm sure to this day I didn't get hurt because they were so, they thought I was so stupid at what I was doing, they weren't gonna hurt me, okay? But I, I tell those two stories to young undercover agents that I train now, because that's how it was in those days, okay? There was no training, there was no, uh, nobody showing you the ropes. So I needed to learn how to be an undercover, okay? I needed to learn how to be like a bad guy. How did I learn how to be a bad guy? Who taught me? Anybody? Bingo. 
What better person to teach you to be a bad guy than a real bad guy? So I would get with people who were cooperating with the FBI. We have all fancy names for them now. They were informants. They inform on other people. And that's what I did. I would sit down with informants and have them teach me how to be an undercover agent. Okay? And again, I'm not, uh, I would never toot my horn. I've told you from the first day I was awful and uh, we have a lot of help. But after 30 years, I got pretty good at this stuff. I learned how to do it because I wanted to learn how to do it. Okay? <clears throat> so I'm going to take you through, I'm going to take you through three cases fairly quickly. Um, that involved the LCN, the La Cosa Nostra, okay? Um, the first one was 1999, and it was, again, I don't know who in this room is an LCN historian, but in 1999, there was a mob boss in Philadelphia by the name of Joey Molino, who's very well known. And Molino, <clears throat> I was in Boston at the time, and when I was first assigned, I told you I worked in Philadelphia, um, I had been on an arrest team in Philadelphia when we arrested Merlino on an armored car job. I'm sorry, on, on a, um, a um, I think it was an armored car job. Uh, but we had been, I had been on an arrest team and I had helped arrest Merlino before this case. So I obviously couldn't meet Merlino during this investigation, but Merlino was aligned with a, a Boston group of bad guys led by a guy named Bobby Luisi. Okay, and remember the name Bobby Luisi because that's going to come up later. But I was assigned to infiltrate Luisi's group in Boston who was trying to uh, uh, take over some of the rackets up in Boston. Okay, it's a very unusual arrangement. Mob families usually don't work uh, like that. But there was, a, there was a void in the Boston mob at the time. Again, for those of you who study history, the Angelo family had been knocked out by the FBI, and, and now we were getting into the, the next group of people trying to take it over. And again, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Boston organized crime history, but there was a shooting in a restaurant there called the 99 Restaurant in Charlestown, Massachusetts in 1995. It was a mob shootout where four members of a, a crime group were, were murdered while they were eating steak tips. And Bobby Luisi's family were the victims of that uh, shooting, and there is evidence to believe Luisi may have had some uh, involvement in, in making that happen. So Bobby Luisi was a violent guy. He was out on the street, obviously. He was working hand-in-hand -hand with Merlino, and it was my job to eventually purchase cocaine from this group. We knew they were selling cocaine, and my job was to uh, make a, a drug case, okay? You can't buy cocaine from the mob the first or second time you meet them. You've got to ingratiate yourself. You've got to get them to trust you. So I was what's called an earner. An earner is somebody who's not a made guy, who's not even Italian, but he makes money for the mob, okay? Okay, he's an associate. There's all kinds of terminology, but <clears throat> the best terminology is I was an earner. So I would make money from criminal endeavors and kick it to the mafia so I could work in Boston under their protection. So again, remember it's 1999, but I sold them stolen fur coats, stolen film, stolen cigarettes, all little, uh, little crimes to get them to trust me, okay? So eventually we're building up to make this drug case in 1999. Philadelphia FBI is investigating Merlino down in um, uh, Philadelphia at the time, and Boston FBI is investigating Luisi and his crowd. Okay, if you, if you ever want to look at that book, there's a book called The Last Gangster written by a Philadelphia crime reporter named George Anastasia uh, who captured that case in that book, The Last Gangster. And there was an informant in that case. He was the one who introduced me into the mob by the name of Ron Prevetti. Okay, Ron, Pre Ron Prevetti has been um, testified in court. He passed away last year, uh, but he was the informant in that case. So Luisi and Merlino were working together. Prevetti introduced me to them to buy cocaine. Fast forward, I spend months with these guys, literally every day, back in the days of the pager. I'd get a page, I'd have to go to the social club, hang out there all day, talk to them. When you deal with mob guys, first of all, I pretty much enjoy the company of mob guys more than I do FBI agents, okay? They're a lot more fun, they're a lot more interesting, and they have, they're great storytellers. Other than when they're killing each other, they're not bad guys. 
okay? But I would be with these guys around the clock every day of the week, okay? And in 1999, after about four or five months with these guys, I finally was able to buy uh, a kilogram of, uh, two kilograms of cocaine from them, okay? And it's all videotaped, it's all audio tape, it's excellent evidence, and it ties back to the Philadelphia mob in Philadelphia. Memorial Day weekend of 1999, I get a call from my SAC, special agent in charge, who calls me into the office. He says, Mike, we're pulling you out. Why are you doing that? He says, I can't tell you, which is the right answer. He couldn't tell me, but I wanted to know. And myself and the case agent running the case, we made a, a vigorous argument. We wanted to stay involved in the case to finish it up. We only had about a month or so more to do, uh, go. We were timing our arrest with the Philadelphia case. So we wanted to, you know, end on a, a high note. So he eventually allowed us to go back with the understanding I couldn't go inside any of these clubs anymore. I had to do everything out on the street so surveillance agents could watch me and make sure nothing happened to me. So I would go meet these guys in the north end of Boston and, and do my thing out in the street. And shortly after the Memorial Day weekend, when we convinced them I could go back, the first time I walked in to work, walked down to the social club where I normally went inside, I looked in and I saw Bobby Luis and I waved to him. I said, Bobby, come out. And he's like, no, you come in. And we're standing there in a, in a standoff. You come out, you come in. And now I see two of his henchmen coming up from either side. I know these guys carry guns. I've seen them with guns before. So I'm like, I sh probably should have listened to my boss. I don't understand why they want me to come into the club. Now they're coming up the street. So we go into the club and I literally take like one step in and I don't want to go any further, okay? And any FBI undercover agent who tells you they don't get scared is full of something, okay? My knees were literally knocking together, all right? But you don't have a choice. You have to talk your way out of situations. I'm not going to fight these guys. There's three guys. They're bigger than me. Two of them have guns. You got to use your mouth and, and use your mind. So I go into the club where I wasn't supposed to go, and then the next thing they say is, Mike, you need to come down in the basement. Okay, I don't know if any of you have ever been in the basement of a social club, but it's probably not where you want to go, okay? I had never been in that basement. I never want to go back to that basement. I didn't have a choice, okay? So I mentioned earlier my dad was a cop, and I grew up around cops all my life. My dad, uh, uh, was a great dad, except when he was drinking. And when he was drinking, he was a, a horrible dad, and that's in the book. But he had been dead now for about 25 years, okay? I got down in his basement, and there's a jukebox. Okay, those days still had jukeboxes. I get down into the basement, and the jukebox is playing My Way by Frank Sinatra. <laughs> that was the only song I ever heard my father sing in his life. And that's weird when you go down into a basement when you think you're about to get killed and that song is playing on the uh, jukebox. So in my opinion, that was my dad either from, probably from below but maybe above, telling me I was going to walk out of there alive, okay? And once we got downstairs in the basement, uh, they started to talk about cocaine, so I knew I was okay. I didn't have to talk my way out. They were initiating more cocaine conversation. So we ended up ordering up more cocaine, and then about a month later, we arrested them, okay? And on the day of the arrest, as the undercover agent, my job is not to go out and arrest anybody. I'm, I stay in my undercover office, and if they have trouble locating somebody, I'm supposed to call them up and put them down so we can arrest them, all right? And in that office, I had a good guy phone and a bad guy phone. So I had an FBI phone, and I had a phone that the bad guys called me on. And at 6 o'clock in the morning, we started hitting doors. And about five minutes later, the phone rings. Okay, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm just sitting there eating donuts and reading the newspaper. And I go and pick up the FBI phone, and there's nobody on it. And I look, and it's the bad guy's phone ringing. And I go and pick up the bad guy's phone, and then, Mike, Mike, the FBI's coming. Get out of there. Okay, so even on a rest day, these guys were calling to give me a heads up that the FBI were coming. Fast forward, they get arrested, they get interviewed. They asked them about that day they took me down in the basement and what they told me, and I wish I knew this that day, 
They said, we thought Mike was being followed by the FBI and we wanted to protect him, so we took him down into the basement. Okay? So I think I'm getting killed. They think I'm being followed by the FBI. All right? Interesting. All right? There was, some, uh, there was a lot of attention. This was a mob boss. Uh, I think we locked up 15 to 20 people, both in Boston and, and, and uh, Philadelphia. <clears throat> there was a lot of talk. There was a lot of uh, news coverage. And I thought it was interesting because I was watching the news that night with my wife, and there were three people on the TV talking about the case and, and ex, ex, uh, extolling the work of the FBI and undercover agents and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't recognize any, any of the three men. Okay, they were somebody within the FBI who was talking about this case that I don't remember seeing them two or three o'clock in the morning. But, you know, they have their jobs, I have mine. I was very, the thing I was most um, pleased about in that case in the affidavit to arrest Joey Molino, the boss of the Philadelphia mob, in the affidavit it said, quote, basically on such and such a date, Molino told Luisi, so the Boston, I mean, the Philadelphia mob boss is telling the Boston uh, LCN member to, uh, to, tr to treat that undercover like he's one of us, okay? Like he's one of us. So you have a mob boss telling him to treat an FBI undercover agent like he's one of us, right? That's why you do this stuff. That's why I did this stuff for so many years, okay? These guys, these organized crime guys think they're slicker than everybody, okay? I tell you, I enjoy their company. I always have, okay? But they always think they're the smartest guys in the room, and all you got to do is walk through this building to see that they're not, okay? So again, that was the first case uh, that I was involved in on the LCN. That case took about six to nine months to complete, and I was exhausted. When you do this stuff, and, and Jeff mentioned it in his opening, when you do this stuff, you're somebody that you're really not, okay? You have a persona that you have to carry on all day long. Okay, and it, I joke at first about my height and my hair color, but this stuff is, is very taxing on you, both physically and mentally. So you really have to work at keeping your professional life separate from your personal life. And a big part of the book story is about keeping that separation. <clears throat> Anybody who knows Boston, when you leave Boston and head north, there's a bridge called the Tobin Bridge. And when I, I had a rule that when I hit that bridge, once I went north, I was dad, husband, coach, friend, neighbor. <clears throat> and when I came into the city and went over the bridge, I was dope dealer, bank robber. You really have to, that's how you, you had to, I had to have a physical landmark to separate the two lies, okay? The FBI now does psychological testing of their undercover agents. It didn't exist when I first started doing it. When you do an undercover assignment in the FBI, you have to, uh, take a psychological test every six months to stay in the assi to get the assignment, to stay in the assignment, and when you're completed with the assignment, okay? So they didn't have it when I first started. Once they started it, I would take it, and like everything else I did, I would cheat and try to give them the answers I thought they wanted, okay? So finally they came to me, and they said, would you please stop cheating and try to take this truthfully, and we'll see what we got. And so I did that. I answered 600 plus questions. I answered them honestly. And they told me something that day which influenced the rest of my undercover career. Okay, we're going to use a quick example is this bright line here. Okay, these are all good people. And you guys, sorry, but you're all bad people. So this is the bright line that separates good from bad. Okay, <clears throat> most FBI agents, when they take those tests, test way over there, okay? When I took my test, I would test one step from this side, okay? You can't control that. That's something you're born with. That's something you learn growing up, etc. But I was like one step from going over the line, okay? That can be a compliment or an insult. And I took it as an insult at first, and then later I thought it might be a compliment. But because of my upbringing, because I grew up in a blue-collar environment. I grew up with people who went to jail, okay? I tell people in the eighth grade, we were playing a baseball game. The police came to our game, 
and arrested our first baseman during the game for armed robbery. And we just switched positions like that happens every day, okay? We had another kid who didn't like to take tests in high school, so he would call in bomb threats to the high school, except he would call in from his home phone. Okay, to this day, he's, he's known as Boom Boom. Okay, these were the types of characters I grew up with, so it became natural that when I became an FBI agent, which I never intended to, you know, I could see their point of view. I, I had spent some time with these types of people. But that's why I started to form this um, relationship with these mob guys, because I really did understand a lot of their mentality and a lot of thinking. After this Luisi case, everybody goes to jail, and by this time, I got the bug bad. I, I want to do undercover work every day, okay? After that horrible event in Philadelphia where they claimed I was a dope dealing thief, I didn't want to do like regular FBI work. I wanted to work alone. I wanted to do stuff uh, by myself, so I started doing this undercover stuff. And then um, that was 1999 that that case ended. So 2000, about a year later, less than a year later, I get asked to do a case, another mob case, down in Rhode Island <clears throat> with what's known as the Patriarca family. And again, just go upstairs, you'll see the Patriarca family, and it's all its glorious history. They basically ran the New England mob for, for dozens and dozens of years. Uh, <clears throat> there was a guy, there was a captain in the, in the Google, uh, there was a captain in the Patriarca family named Matty Gugliametti. And Matty Gugliametti, for those of you, again, you LCN buffs, in 1989, the Boston FBI, for the first time in history, recorded an actual LCN induction ceremony where they prick the finger and they, and they swear an oath. Uh, the Boston FBI recorded an induction ceremony in which Gugliametti was present. Okay, he was already a captain in the Patriarca family. Gugliametti went to jail after that, number one, for being at that ceremony, and two, for some other crimes he committed in <clears throat> Connecticut. And he was coming out of jail in, in about 2000. And he was, he was being positioned to perhaps take over the leadership of the uh, Patriarca family at that time. He was a union, a union steward in the laborers' union, in Rhode Island. Okay, I don't know if any of you know the history of Rhode Island. It's one of the most corrupt states in the country. Okay, there's been this nefarious relationship between the mob, unions, politicians, etc. So we became proactive and we were gonna, we were gonna go after Guglielmetti basically as soon as he came out of prison because we, and again, for you defense lawyers sitting out here, we properly predicated him. We were, we were authorized by law to go after him because of uh, certain information we had. So my job was to get next to Gugliametti, okay? Now, in the Luisi case, I was introduced by Ron Pervetti. He introduced me right to the top level. This time, I had to work my way up <coughs> the chain to get to Gugliametti. And from the experience I had in the first case, they asked me how long I, they think it would take to meet Gugliametti, and I said, two years. And they said, why is it going to take two years? I said, this guy is just coming out of jail. He wants to be the boss. He doesn't trust anybody. When he went to jail for the 89 ceremony, he didn't even speak on the tape. He was convicted of being there, and he still went to prison. Okay? So he's a very careful and crafty uh, mob guy. Okay? So we set up a scenario that I was this time in the, in the Luisi case, I was just a, a, a businessman, a low-level businessman. I you know, took things that fell off the back of a truck type but in the uh, second LCN case, I'm going to be an astute businessman, okay? And again, the mob wakes up every day. The only thing they think about when they wake up is how do I make money for, tomorrow, to, to, for today? They don't even worry about tomorrow. How do I make money today? So if you position yourself as somebody who can make money for them, you got a shot. So we set up this elaborate background for me, and uh, I finally end up meeting Google Yometti, and... It took just about two years to meet him, but I had to work through a series of soldiers working my way up and um, getting there. But now I'm working this stuff full time, okay? Every day I go to work in Rhode Island. It was like a 200 mile round trip uh, trip for me, but I have to go to this office every day 
and, and try to slowly infiltrate the Rhode Island mob. But I go back and forth. This is why I thank my wife and explain to my children why I was never home. All right? I go and do that, though, for... for um, <clears throat> the case ended up being five years, okay? From 2000 until 2005. So every day for five years, roughly, you know, 20% or 25% of my FBI career was dedicated to this one case. Being undercover for five years is not normal, okay? To be somebody else for five years every day is strange, okay? But I was getting better at this trade craft that we do, so by the end of the case, I was taking Googly and Medi to like my, my children's sporting events and watching the game with him without him understanding one of the players was my kids, okay? I ended up working my mob hours around my kids' sports schedule which sounds goofy, but you, you can do it, okay? It takes a little practice, but you can do it. Um, I love golden retrievers, okay? I, I, I wish I spent more time with golden retrievers than other human beings, all right? But when you, when you work undercover, you gotta take things that you do in your real life and apply them to your undercover work. So there was another guy in Googly Medi's crowd that I would run around and, and we'd go to dog stores or, or dog shelters and, and go and look at dogs. If you're doing this with people, after a while they're like, there's no way this guy can be an FBI agent, you know, he's a dog freak, okay? You have to do things that they don't expect, right? But I spent hours and hours with these guys for five years. Um, the purpose in this case was to determine the relationship between organized crime, LCN organized crime, with public officials in Rhode Island. And we became a construction company, and we actually performed construction work. We bid on contracts, and then we had the contracts performed by legitimate subcontractors. But we were able to get ourselves into the whole union uh, mob side and we were able to flush out the relationship, the nefarious relationship. So at the end, and then another, uh, another violation, Googly Medi was adamantly opposed to any type of drug trafficking except when he could make money, okay? Any mob guy, and I don't, maybe there's mob guys in this audience, I don't know. Any mob guy who tells you they don't do drugs is a liar. They will do drugs if it's worth the risk. Okay, <clears throat> so I went to Googly and Medi and I said, I became partners with Googly and Medi in the construction company. He became a silent partner. So I have a captain in the Patriarca family that I'm working with every day. We're running a construction company, paying off public officials, paying off union officials. And I say to him one day, I said, Matty, do you know how I really make my big money? He goes, I don't want to know. Okay. Well, the reason he doesn't want to know is because he knows that I'm probably doing something I shouldn't be doing, and he doesn't want to be attached to it unless he can make some money, okay? So I said, Maddie, basically what I do is I launder drug funds, okay? But you're my partner, so I won't do any. If you tell me no, I won't do it, okay? What's he going to say? No, say no to drugs, okay? Again, respectfully, the mob telling you they've never been involved in narcotic trafficking is the biggest line of crap you'll ever hear, okay? So I said, Maddie, I won't do it unless you tell me to go ahead. It took about four or five days, and he came back. He says, hey, you know that thing? And this is how they talk. You know that thing we don't want to talk about? Yeah, Maddie. He said, you can do that. I just don't want to know about it. So what he's saying is he wants a payday, but he doesn't want to be charged with that crime. So again, my job as an FBI undercover agent is to gather evidence. I say to him, Matty, you know, you were at that ceremony. What was that all about? I play dumb. Of course I know that's, I've heard the ceremony. And he lays out, this is the trust level, he lays out time and time again what they were doing, what they were talking about, who was being inducted. That's a, that's a fascinating tape, okay? Again, it's the only time a, an induction ceremony has ever been recorded. Fast forward to the end, 2005. I've now been Google Medi's partner for three years. Three years every day with a mob captain figuring out how to make money, okay? He ends up guarding three protection loads. He has the mafia guard cocaine loads for us. 
So you've seen in police corruption cases where they'll have police officers guard cocaine loads. We just did a little bit different. We had the mob guard our cocaine, okay? There's a guy upstairs, Jack Garcia, an FBI undercover agent. Jack was involved in that case with me, and Jack <coughs> was supposedly a, a cocaine supplier out of New York who needed his cocaine protected from New York up to Canada with a pit stop in Rhode Island, and then the mob would come and protect it for us. So the last load was 67 kilos. So the mob, and they, these are real kilos. These are kilos taken out of FBI evidence and transported between other uh, undercover FBI agents. Googly Matty is supposed to get $1,000 a kilo, okay? So 67 kilo, he comes to my office expecting to get paid $67,000 in cash, okay? Truthfully, I had about eight bucks in my pocket that day. Um, two FBI agents come in to arrest him and he turns and he looks and he sees them and he recognizes one that he knows from previous interviews and then he turns to me and the last thing I said to him was I said, Matty, do the right thing, okay? And the look of shock on his face when he realized I was an FBI agent after three years was worth the five years of investigation. He had no idea I was an agent, okay? <clears throat> they arrested him. This is another thing that very unusual. He pled guilty to federal drug charges in less than a week, and that's unheard of in the federal system. And what he did was he pled guilty because he was embarrassed he had been played by the FBI. That's a captain in the Patriarca family, okay? Again, five years. Um, <clears throat> so that's the second LCN case. You know, we don't keep a scorecard, but a lot of agents don't infiltrate multiple LCN families just doesn't happen, okay? But because of the circumstances, I had that opportunity. And then about a year later, so I needed a little break after five years, so I spent the next year getting ready for court, et cetera. <clears throat> 2006, an agent comes to me, goes, what do you think about the cheese man? I don't know if any of you know the cheese man out of Boston, but it was a guy named Carmen Denunzio. He was the underboss in Boston. He was called the cheese man because, number one, he owned a cheese shop, and number two, he weighed about 400 pounds, okay? He was a complete blob, okay? And again, not being disrespectful, but he did not strike the fear of God into you. And I don't, I don't uh, control who I get assigned to investigate, but Matty Googly Matty was slick. Carmen, uh, Carmen was not, okay? So in the first case, I'm a businessman. The second case, I'm a businessman. The third case, Carmen wants to sell $6 million worth of toxic loom, which is dirt, to the state of Massachusetts to plant on a, a, a construction project. All right? This is what I mean. They wake up every day trying to think of something to make money. They want to sell bad dirt, poison dirt, to the state. Okay. And some of the agents are like, this is stupid, why are we doing this? Well, it's a perfect opportunity, all right? They asked me to do the undercover. I become the corrupt state, Massachusetts state official who's gonna cut the dirty uh, loom deal, all right? So they, they tell me, this is my assignment from those days of when I have to go find stuff out. This case, they say, Mike, we need you to piss Carmen off. We need you to th have him threaten you. I was like, that's easy, all right? <clears throat> that's easy. We start, I start dealing with this group. I literally had to learn about dirt. I don't know if you, any of you know this. There's actually a lot of information about dirt that you have to know. I had to go to dirt school and learn how to talk about dirt. <clears throat> the very first time I met these guys, the state of Massachusetts allowed me to take one of their state trucks, and again, I don't know what highway department trucks out here. In Massachusetts, they're huge and they're lime green, okay? And I dress up as a, as a state official with a hard hat and boots and everything, and I go driving into this dirt farm, spinning a, spinning a lime green truck. I, I actually lost control of the truck that I couldn't handle, okay? But, you know, it's spinning all over the place. These guys are looking at me like I'm kind of some nut. All right, but I'm whipping around and I drive, and they're literally jumping out of the way. And I, and I apologize in advance to the ladies here, 
But as soon as I get done, I park the car, and I get out, and in front of everybody, I urinate on the tire, okay? And I urinate, and I walk over to them, and I shake, my, I shake their hands without washing my hands. And these guys are literally like, you know, <laughs> right? And again, by this time, I was pretty good at what I was doing. So I take a phone, like I take a phone call, and I walk away, and I stand on the side, and I talk on the phone to nobody for 15 minutes. I'm completely ignoring them, okay? This is driving them nuts, because I know this is all going to get back to Denunzio, uh, okay? Do people, anybody here ever seen the TV show Caesar Milan, The Dog Whisperer? My favorite show ever, okay? Caesar Milan, The Dog Whisperer. I can tell you for a fact that dog control techniques work better on human beings. I'm, I'm not joking. You'll read in here my, my love of Cesar Milan, okay? If you watch that show, he will teach you how to control a dog without the dog understanding you're controlling him. And I would watch that show, and then I would go to work and try these dog techniques on people. And they work most of the time, okay? So anyway, I make these mob guys at this dirt farm furious. They're ready to kill me, but I'm the only guy who can forge the paperwork to buy the $6 million worth of dirt, so I basically tell them, you guys are, you know, you guys are nobody. I need to hear from the big boss. I need, who's ever running this thing, I need to talk directly to the guy. Now, I don't say I know it's Denunzia. I don't say I know it's the mob. But you guys are like, nobody. Give me to your boss. So this all gets back to Denunzio, and he's fuming, all right? <laughs> we have some electronic surveillance. We, so he's talking about this Massachusetts state inspector. He wants to stick a hatchet in his face. Okay, so I set up a meeting with Denunzio, and for those, again, who know LCN culture, this is unheard of. Denunzio was the underboss. He's meeting with a complete stranger. Never should have happened. This is how they lost their discipline over the years. This is how greedy they became, and we took advantage of it, okay? 40, 50 years ago, this would never happen, okay? But they're now seeing green. They think they can pay off a state inspector. So I go to this meeting, with Denunzio, and I intentionally make believe I don't know who he is. So he's like trying to, he says, you know who I am? I said, no. He says, I'm the cheese man. Uh, you sell cheese? No, no, I'm the cheese man. I said, I don't know who the hell you are, but you know, this thing ain't going to happen unless I get paid, blah, blah, blah. And now he, we're out in a parking lot, and he's furious. And this is where I, you know, the Cesar Milan stuff, this is now 20 years of experience. I start talking to him. I said, you know, you shouldn't get this upset in the heat. You know, you, you have, you're carrying a few extra pounds. You may want to, like, settle down so you don't have a heart attack. And I start talking to him about diet plans. <laughs> okay? And the agents who are listening to this are like, what is he doing, you know? But think about it, okay? He heard a story about this nut driving around in a lime green truck and doing dog tricks. And now I'm talking to him about diet plans because he weighs 400 pounds. This is a mob underboss, okay? Does he think this idiot's an FBI undercover agent? No, okay? And this is what I learned after doing this year after year after year. You can't present your, you know, FBI agents are type A personalities. But you're now in their world. You've got to learn how to control them in their world, like Cesar Milan, okay? I end up negotiating with him to buy the the dirty loom, these are, these are federal violations. Whether you know it or not, you know, selling toxic loom is, is a federal violation, all right? So we, <clears throat> we end up making a case against Carmen and all these other guys I met. True story, they go out to arrest Carmen. For, now, this is my third mob case in eight years, okay? So, they go, so I make these tapes, and we get the evidence against Carmen. They got to do some more work, so it's, it's over a year later when they go to arrest him. So they go out one morning. I have nothing to do with the arrest. They go out one morning, and they lock Carmen up. And he knows it's the FBI, but he doesn't know what he's arrested for. He, doesn't, he hasn't gone to court yet. So they take him in the FBI office. The FBI mug room in Boston is on the eighth floor, and it's opposite where the FBI gym is. So that morning, I, go, I was, at the time, I went to the gym every morning at the same time, you know, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. 
I'm walking by the elevators to go to the gym, and the doors open. You hear the ping, and the doors open. And Carmen is standing there handcuffed with two agents next to him. And he turns and he looks at me, and I look at him, and just like I said the whole time, all the case long, I said, hey, Carmen, how you doing? And he looked, and he turned to the agents, and he said, I'm so effed. <laughs> okay? He had no idea until he saw me that it was the FBI. Okay? <clears throat> that, was, um, that was the third mob case. I'll tell one more quick story, and then Jeff's going to take over. Um, the first case I mentioned to you was about Bobby Luisi and the Boston mob, okay? I wrote this book. It came out last fall. I wrote it with a guy named Ralph Pizzullo out of L.A. Last fall, Ralph gets a call, and the guy says, hey, this, I'm Bobby Luisi. I'm in your book. And Ralph says, really? And Bobby says, would you do me a favor? Would you sign the book and send it to me? Okay? And Ralph says, yeah, I'd be happy to. You want Mike to sign it? And Bobby Luisi said, Mike would never sign that. And he goes, yeah, I'll ask him. So he called me and he said, hey, would you sign Luisi's book for him? I said, yeah, sure. He served his time. He did 18 years in prison because of that case. So I wrote, I took the book and I wrote, Bobby, no hard feelings. And I sent it back to him. This man went to prison for 18 years, and he's asking us to sign his book. Okay? Don't know what happened. Um, that's the LCN stories. Those are three cases I worked in about eight years. The last major undercover I did, we're here at the you know, Organized Crime Museum. I did some Russian stuff, and the last case I did was uh, Chapo Guzman and the Sinaloa Cartel. Okay, so I, I kind of bounced around. I just didn't do mob stuff. I did other stuff, all of which was fascinating and fun. And then they kicked me out. <laughs> I hit a mandatory age in the FBI. They kick you out at 57, whether you're still productive or not. So now I, I walk around and just talk about this stuff. Thank you very much for your time. All right, uh, so what we're gonna do is take some questions. Keep in mind, you can, you know, as uh, Mike mentioned, he's, he's had a really varied career, so you can ask him about a lot of different things. Um, we've, when, if you do have a question, I want you to raise your hand, and then I will call, we'll bring a microphone over to you, and then you, so everyone can hear your question. So wait to ask your question until we bring the microphone around. Uh, let's go ahead and start. Who has a question? Never, not everybody at once. <laughs> Here's a, let's go to the second row in the back here. I was just wondering if they ever figured out who stole the heroin. I'm sorry? Did they ever figure out who stole the heroin? Yes. <clears throat> there was an agent who sat two seats in front of me. Uh, not only did he steal the heroin, he stole 11 kilos of cocaine from a different case, and the only agent in common in both cases was me. So for some reason, he wanted to point the finger at me, and it took him about five months to figure it out. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison, and he's out. And we don't exchange Christmas cards. <laughs> All right, do we have another question? Let's go up to the front here. We'll bring the microphone up to you. Regarding the induction ceremony that is on tape, is that available for public consumption? I believe so. That was, I know it was played in federal court. So anything that is in federal court, my understanding is it's public record. If I recall correctly, um, Oscar Goodman, uh, our, you know, one of the founders of this museum, had some role in that. In other words, he, in fact, I think he was on the other side of a case that was played and it didn't play well for his, uh, his defendant. I, don't because, uh, think it, I didn't think it would. <laughs> I don't remember that whole story. We'll have to have Oscar come in and tell it sometime. Here's one in the, in the middle. Yeah, Mike. Uh, has the FBI lost any agents undercover? I'm sorry? Has the FBI lost any undercover agents? Yes, Charles Reed was killed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in March of 1996 uh, during a cocaine transaction. He was shot and killed, and he killed the shooter. Is that the only one? That's the only FBI agent. I know some DEA agents also. De uh, Everett Hatcher is a famous DEA. So between state, federal, and local law enforcement, I know of at least 20 events where 
law enforcement has been killed doing this. It's not, you know, I try to be a little bit humorous up here. We do what's very serious. Um, you can get killed any day you go to work. Just a, just a life. Well, Mike, there's a question I might have for you. Was there uh, uh, an instance where you felt like, I mean, you, t you mentioned one case, but other cases where you might have been found out and you thought, well, this is it for me? What happened was when I was young and stupid versus when I was old and stupid. When I was young and stupid, I wouldn't take those signals. I'd ignore them. As I got more experienced and understood what it was and what was at stake, there were times that I either wouldn't have taken an assignment or I stopped an assignment. For the, you, need to, you need to recognize there's no case, Louis Free said this, there's no case worth an agent's life. All right, we have a question uh, toward the back here. Have you ever been worried about revenge from any of the cases that you've yep. been involved in? Yep, and just so for the record, every, I've spoken between 75 and 100 times about the book, and that question is asked at every event. No, that's the, that's the one question that's always asked. And, my aunt, and I've given a lot of thought. The answer is no, because I believe that if I was going to get hurt, I would have got hurt while I was doing it with them. So I faced them in the street, and then I later faced them in court, so they know who I am. You go to court in these cases, the defense attorney asks you your name, and the second question is, where do you live? Just to get under your skin, okay? Some judges allow it, you have to, you have to tell them where you live, okay? In my opinion, this is my personal opinion, it would be foolhardy for anybody to take a run at an agent we have the biggest army in the world. There's 13,000 of us. If you come after us, we're coming after you. It's that simple. So no, I've never worried about it. And in my experience, I think I've known of only two cases in the FBI in my 30 plus years where agents were legitimately threatened. I wasn't one of those two cases. So um, no, I don't worry about it. That's my job. The Constitution allows people to face their accusers. That's what, we're the only country, people don't know this, we're the, literally the only country in the world where law enforcement testifies in their true name. But that's, that's what our Constitution demands. I think we have a question in the front row. We'll bring a microphone to you. During the course of your investigation in Boston and, and Philadelphia, did this cross over what was then ongoing, the pizza trials, the, uh, the heroin distribution were, were yeah, either Philadelphia no. or Boston involved? Was that part of The your... Pizza Connection case, the, the Family Commission case, those are basically about one generation before this stuff. So those cases would, had been, um, they were either in trial or been adjudicated at that time. When, you, that talk about, had, when had... you talk about like Pistone and that crowd, I'm one group after him. So like Joey Molina came after what, Philip Testa and... Phil uh, Testa, Angelo Nicky Bruno. Scarfo, right. uh, John Stanford, that whole crowd. And was he involved in Atlantic City? Did Joey Milano was... Uh, Mil uh, Joey Molino. Molino. Yeah, he was involved in Atlantic City as well? Yeah, Atlantic City comes under Philadelphia in the mob. Right, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Mike, you, uh, you only retired about a year ago, maybe year two and years. Half. A year and a half ago. Um, What's your impression of, of traditional organized crime today? Is it, I mean, it still exists in New York, Chicago. What do L you think? LCN? Yeah. People who tell you the N LCN is gone is, are being foolhardy, I believe. Um, th there's certainly not the same influence that they previously had in New York, Chicago. Uh, the mob still exists, but what they have done is they have branched out and they have to work with other crime groups. But when you just say the mob, people think of the LCN. The mob now is just different. It's basically transnational groups. There's always some type of organized, organized crime um, problem for the FBI, okay? But we've had FBI, everything in the FBI changed on 9-11, okay? Prior to 9-11, organized crime, specifically LCN organized crime, was the number one crime priority for the FBI. And then the towers got blown up, and it's been different since then. But if we, if we lose our ability to remain vigilant about LCN, they're, they're not going away, especially in New York. Okay? There's too much money. 
It's that simple. Do we have another question? Anybody? Yeah, right in the, sec in the middle here. Yes. Hold on. We're going to get a microphone for you. No, what the difference is with the Russian group versus Cosa Nostra? Because now the, we hear about the Russian model. What was the difference? Yeah. The Russians were a lot smarter. <laughs> the, they were. The, the target I went up against, so I worked at one, organ, one Russian organized crime case for two years before I did any of the LCN stuff. The, the head of the Russian group I was targeting was literally a rocket scientist. Okay? I don't think you've confused me for a rocket scientist this evening. He would do mathematical crossword puzzles for relaxation. And I was never able to give him one of the answers. Okay? But again, the Russian was no different than the Italians because they all have one weakness and they commit crimes. And that's what we're here to prevent. I think we, uh, well, let's take a question here. Uh, you'd mentioned uh, taking the soil test and figuring out about dirt. Um, what would you say is the strangest thing you had to look into in any one of the cases that you've done, just as far as <laughs> out there skills or hobbies or anything like that that you had to take on? That's a great question, and I got a great answer for you. During the Patriarcha Rhode Island mob case, I was supposed to be a wealthy businessman transitioning from one business into construction. And the bad guys wanted me to look into investing in strip clubs, which was fine with me, okay? And they took me one day, it was a Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, they took me to a closed strip club, but what I didn't know is they wanted to sell me the business attached to it, which was a sex shop. And so at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, I got a tour of a massive warehouse full of sex toys and and activities, and as I was walking around, looking at all this craziness, there was a room, and I looked in, and there was a gentleman who looked just like you, an average looking, nice young man, who had on leather chaps, okay, an opening, and then he was pulling a mask over his face. And on the tape, I was good, on the tape, all I said was, hey, how you doing? Okay? <laughs> And I went outside to my partner. I, I would always have a partner that I went to these things with. And the tape recorder is still rolling when you finish your meeting. You have to be very careful. You don't say something you shouldn't. And he said, in 30 years, he never heard me say one word except that day. And all I said was, wow. <laughs> okay. And that sight is seared into my memory forever. It was the strangest thing I'd ever seen. All right. Uh, well, I, I, want, I don't think we can let you go without one quick note about your role with El, the El Chapo case. Yep. Talk about that. Yep. Um, quickly, in 2009, okay, 2009, Boston FBI had an opportunity. We had an informant that had worked with the Pablo Escobar organization in Colombia. And he went to prison, and while he was in prison for 17 years, he became connected to the Sinaloa cartel. So in 2009, if you don't know the history, the Sinaloa cartel was the most powerful drug organization in the world. Chapo Guzman, the head of it, was hiding in the mountains. That was during his first escape. So we were introduced, we were introduced as a Sicilian crime group. We had no connection to the United States. So I played a Sicilian crime boss, and from 2009 to 2012, we went against the Sinaloa cartel they told us at one point during that, they told us we were the only organization more disciplined than they were. So that's pretty good to have the Sinaloa cartel say the FBI is more disciplined than they are. Okay? I exchanged phone calls and handwritten notes with Chapo, and in 2012 we indicted Chapo and arrested basically his executive board. Okay? That was the highlight of my undercover career, to go up against them at the end of your career and make a case against them. And again, there were three other undercover agents in the case with me. They were outstanding. I was the El Jefe, El Viejo, the old man, believe it or not, okay? But the three, the three undercovers set it up perfect for me, and we were able to indict uh, Guzman and his crowd. Excellent. All right, well, um, I think we're going to transition to the book sale and signing down in the store. Uh, please join me in thanking Michael. Thank Excellent. You.
Okay.